Happy Friday, everyone. It is I, Glenn Kyle, at the Northeast Georgia History Center. Very pleased to be bringing this members-only broadcast to you with some timely information and, and history stuff. So, as I said, it's Friday. Why is it a good thing that it's Friday approaching, not quite there, but approaching that 5 o'clock hour? Because that means that a lot of people are about to get off of work. What is work, you say? Well, actually, you don't say that because everyone, every adult knows what work is. And we want to go home. We want to cease our labor and begin to perhaps enjoy some things for ourselves because most of us have just worked a 40-ish hour work week. Why am I stumbling on about this? Because this is what we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about the history of work and sort of a little bit, and then we're going to move on into labor and unions and labor movements and the rights and, and things like that and how all this plays into, a, into our modern conception of work and the work that we do. So, you know, I always love to start at the very, very most basic fundamental level. What is labor, right? What is work? I know that sounds silly, but you have to think about these things. It's, it's when you use your body, not necessarily your mind, but your body to perform tasks that contribute to your well-being, the well-being of the community, and to provide sustenance, shelter, uh, improved quality of life for you and yours, right? That, that's what labor is. And for much of human history, by far the most common type of labor was, were those who were farmers, who labored in the earth and created crops, uh, and you know this is we could we could begin at the very beginning and start talking about what civilization is, but we're not going to go that far. But people who grow crops, who use the earth to uh, sustain themselves and to find ways to shelter themselves and, and to improve their lives, to sustain their life, that's what labor is. So as time goes forward, people continue to work. Now you know subsistence farming is is the term that we use when someone or a, a family or a unit farms the land and grows the crops that they need to survive, that they consume to remain healthy. So they're not necessarily, the focus of it is to grow crops for themselves, not to grow crops uh, that would have an excess that they could then sell or trade for money or for other goods or things like that. Substance farming. As time goes by and as uh, cultures develop, as civilizations develop, there are things that create surplus, whether it's technological advances, a good growing season, uh, movement of peoples to a, to a more fertile climate, more fertile area. You're going to have surpluses. With those surpluses comes the ability to feed more people than you actually you know, have working on the farm. And with that, perhaps those extra people, rather than having to work for the food, could perform certain tasks for the community that would make things easier. Not everyone wants to make clothing or shoes for themselves or to uh, prepare a plow to, to work the earth or to pre create harness for the animal power to, to pull the, the plow. Instead of having to do that yourself, what if you could have someone who could specialize in that specific kind of labor? Uh, blacksmiths tailors, shoemakers, um, bakers, right? If you, if you could have someone bake the bread for you. That would, that would take some of the work off of your plate and allow you time uh, to do other things, perhaps increase the surplus of your crops so that you could then have more money or at least more trading power to get some of those other things. You see, you see where I'm going with this. So that specialized um, skill set that creates some of those specific things is also labor. And as time goes by, and we'll talk about this as we get into the segment, that is sort of what we come to see as labor. Not that farmers don't work, far from it. But the technical term labor tends to apply to those who, rather than working the land, work for some type of wage to produce something uh, mechanical, produce non-food type items, if, if that makes sense. But these skills uh, and these skill sets for these specific tasks do require a certain amount of expertise. And the more complicated the task as time goes by, you're going to have folks who have to learn how to do them. And, and here with me, you see a great picture of a baker putting some, a loaf of bread into an oven. Now, this is, you, this, is, this is the great thing about history. You get to really look at these primary sources. Look at this picture with me. And this is not a family kitchen. 
right? This is not a uh, mom and th her daughters making bread for the family. This is, this is a mass production effort. So that means that it takes a certain amount of expertise to create that much flour, to get the mixes that right in that quantities, to have an oven big enough to operate the oven in such a way that you can effectively create that many loaves of bread, that is an expertise, that is labor. And you need help, you need someone that you can pass that skill onto, that's when the apprenticeship system was born, right? This is those specialized skills, tradesmen, rather than, than labor or uh, farmers, you have tradesmen who know how to do things like um, bake bread, make clothes, make coal for the blacksmith, a blacksmith, shoemakers, all these sorts of things are become specialized. And because you want them sort of all in one place, they tend to cluster in towns and villages rather than in the countryside the way small farming communities might. So, you know, when, when you get these apprentices, that is a whole other set of labor that comes about. How does an apprenticeship work? I'm so glad I asked myself that question. I'll share the answer with you. You have someone who is a master, someone who has learned the craft and is old enough to have gotten not only very good at it, but uh, has a successful business carrying out that kind of work. I'm going to go ahead and use the, um, the, the picture you see here of of a shoemaker, right? How many of you, if, raise your hand if you can make shoes. Probably no one out there makes shoes, but I would also venture to guess everyone out there is wearing shoes right now, or at least has some shoes in your closet. We don't make those things, we use the labor we have to get money to buy the things we need. So an apprentice is going to need to learn this skill, and so a master will take on a young boy, this, we're usually talking about boys at this point, um, We'll get into to women's roles later, but right now the apprentice system is generally built around um, male work. So they'll take a young boy, and, and it's an application process. Often it was the workman's son, but not always. And they would take this person, that person would in effect agree to be their servant, not their slave, but their servant, until they had learned everything they needed to know. The master would provide a place to live, the master would provide all of the food, the master would provide most of the clothing for that apprentice to begin learning the skill. And that apprentice would learn everything about the skill, right? And so when you're talking about, uh, like this picture has, uh, a shoemaker, you don't just go to Tanny Leather, buy a side of uh, leather, and start making shoes. They're going to teach them everything. Let's go see how the leather is made. Let's go find out how leather is tanned so that we can pick out the best quality leather for what our needs are going to be. Let's go talk to a, a silversmith to see how the needles are made. Let's go talk to a blacksmith to make sure he can make us the right type of hammers and things. And I chose this picture because it's, it's sort of an image of the perfect representation of a master and apprentice relationship, right? The apprentice has just been taught something, some part of his skill, and he's performing it. And the, the master is there perhaps doing another part of the work, but he's watching his apprentice to make sure that he does it right. And the apprentice learns the skill. The apprentice learns the market, right? The apprentice develops his own set of tools, his own set of techniques, his own style, but he's still learning those basic skills of shoemaking from the master. He's also learning how to conduct the business, how to keep accounts, how much should you charge for shoes, how much should you pay for leather. Again, it's every single aspect of this trade. And so after a certain point, and we're talking a period of sometimes 15 years before the apprentice can go from being an apprentice to what's called a journeyman, right? So a journeyman has acquired those basic, basic skills, but they are not necessarily a master of their craft. They may stay with a master for a little longer, but at that point they can also go and sort of do their own work and open their own shop without supervision but it's recognized in the, the trade guilds and things that they're not necessarily ready to take on an apprentice or to become a, a preeminent member of that particular trade. That's going to take several more years of work, several more years of showing that you can not only create the, the stuff that you're apprenticed or uh, trained to make, but that you can make a successful business of it as, business of it as well. So the apprentice system lasts from really, we have evidence of, of a version of it in the ancient times 
quite frankly, all the way up to the present day, there are still apprentices being practiced, and most of those have to do with a lot of the trades, uh, carpentry, electrical work, um, even nursing is, is a degreed thing, but there are also some apprentice type, and, and even with medical doctors, right? They, they go to school, they learn, but they have to go through a residency where they're following in the steps of, a, of an MD, of a, of a real doctor to kind of learn that. So the concept of apprenticeships is still with us, was very, very common all the way up until the 1900s, and, and some things begin to happen in the 1800s called the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is, this is a lot of things. That's a big topic, but basically what it means is that uh, technology has begun to develop to uh, labor-saving devices, but also more efficient means of production using mechanical power, mechanical tools to do a lot of things that used to be taken care of by masters and apprentices, right? Things like textiles, things like um, lumber, things like um, tools are beginning to be produced in factories. And the skill is sort of, you know, going away because the machine does all the, the hard work, the labor by weaving the cloth, uh, by forging the tools and things like that. It still requires workers, though. This is not uh, the modern-day fear of robots taking all of our jobs, right? The machines still require a lot of work with them. As farmers continue to grow crops, as the master and apprentice system goes to cities, they're still sort of dependent on a place, right? A farmer has to have their farm, their acres on which they grow their food. A master, a tradesman, has to have their shop somewhere where they do the work and sell their wares out of. Now, the factory sits over there, but a person who works in the factory, a laborer, a worker, isn't necessarily tied to that place. He can take his skill set and go from factory to factory to factory, right? He's not tied to a specific geographic area or even, or even a specific building. So... That means that he's going to depend 100% on wages. He's going to be uh, take a job working at a, at a mill, at a, at a factory, at a foundry, um, with steam cars, things with steam cars, listen to me, railroads, <laughs> working on railroads, and they're going to get paid money for their labor, right? And they take that money, and from that money, they have to provide all the necessities of life for themselves and for their families. The farmer has land, the farmer can grow food, the farmer has prepared a house. A tradesman has a shop, he has a customer base, he has a place to live, he has things. A laborer doesn't necessarily have those things, they have to take their money to do it, which means they're gonna have to pay for a roof over their head, they're gonna have to pay for all their food, uh, they're gonna have to pay for their clothing, things like that. So those wages become the central issue of their economic and social well-being, not only of themselves, but of their family unit, however big that family unit has to be. And because many of these uh, new textile mills and these, these uh, industrial places are centered around a spot, they're all going to move into this one big place to work there, right? So these mills would often create villages, little towns, where uh, the mill company would basically own the town. They would build, you know, 200 houses, and then they would rent them out to the workers. So, you know, you had to ha the condition of living in one of these houses was that you worked at the factory. Uh, if you got a job at the factory, you would get paid from the factory, but of course they would deduct from your wages the cost of rent per month. They might have a company store where they sold things like shoes, clothes, um, food, and you could go there and shop. And rather than having to pay cash for it, you could uh, just have them put it on your account so they would deduct it from your wages. So you, you see where this is, is starting to go. Um, if you work at a village, excuse me, if you work at a mill, your rent is being deducted, your food is being deducted, your clothes are being deducted. You may not get very much, if at all, actual currency payday because all of these things are happening. That makes it very, very difficult for you to get ahead. It makes it very, very difficult for you to have enough to have anything extra. As a result, many of the, the laboring families would all go in, the husband, the wife, sisters, brothers, uncles, 
and the children. They would find employment sometimes at the same factory, right? Because then they would get that much more money coming in. Now, this is, this is well before the days of, of equal uh, pay for equal work. It was just a matter of fact that a woman working in a factory or a child working in a factory was going to be paid less than a man. It was posted right there on the wall. This is the way it is. If you don't like it, you don't have to work here. So, you know, the women are not going to bring in as much. The children are certainly not going to bring in as much. But you get a cumulative effect of a, of a little bit more money that helps people start to get ahead. And, you know, in a large factory, you're going to have a lot of workers. And those workers are all becoming dependent upon the business or upon the corporation. And this is one of those views of how labor began to organize. So a corporation is a formal conglomeration, an agreement between people to invest and conduct business to do what is best for the business and create a firm that makes something, right? It's a business that makes something, a corporation. So they have formally and legally engaged themselves in the cause of seeking profit for, for improving their well-being. Labor, workers begin to realize, you know, maybe, maybe we could do something like that on our end. Maybe we could create some sort of corporation, some sort of organization that we could all join that we could begin to maneuver for and press for things that would be of great benefit to us, right? So this is the very, very beginnings, and this is usually, generally speaking, in a nutshell, as our coffee mugs say, uh, this is a post-Civil War phenomenon, and people began to want to come together so that, you know, they, they would have some, some power at the company. If all your workers, if, you're, if you own the, the factory or you run the factory and all your workers say, you know what, unless we get a dollar a week raise, none of us are going to come in tomorrow. Well, technically, you can, you know, you can fire them all and, and have them removed from all those mill houses and, and hire other people in, but that's going to be a very complicated process. It's going to totally shut down the factory for probably a week or two at least, which means that your factory is not going to be making money for you are for the, your business. Your business might go under, right? So these are things that labor realizes that it can begin to agitate for. Um, you know, and, and people who live in these areas, and again, these are primarily urbanized areas, right? They don't want their kids to go work in these factories. Where should kids be when they're this age? They should be in school. As a side note, this, this is a very cool photo. This picture is actually from Macon, Georgia, from a textile mill uh, right here in Georgia, I want to say in the in the 1910s, I think is is when this one was. Um, but you see here, these are pretty young kids, and they're working machinery that's fairly dangerous, right? And that's that's one of the things too that labor began to realize was not working in their favor. Uh, if you're if you or a member of your family was working on the machine, and heaven forfend, you got your hand you know caught in part of the machinery and it was mangled or even just temporarily hurt, if you just broke a bone, then you're not going to be able to work for that length of time. And then, do you think you're going to get paid? No, because you're not working. This is in the era before anything like that. So if you got hurt, you just didn't work, and you didn't get money. And um, if you were disabled, if you actually did, say, lose a hand or an arm in a piece of machinery at a factory, the owner would say, I am very sorry to hear about that. We hope you get better soon. Here is the door. We need to hire someone who can actually do the job. And that was it. Right? And so, this is not fair. These, all these laborers are beginning to realize that, that the deck is totally stacked against them. So the movement begins, and especially when we start getting to the 1870s and the 1880s, the, the Gilded Age of American history. Um, labor really begins to organize. Now, it's also important to remember, too, there is a lot of change going on in the United States. In the post-Civil War economy, there's lots of expansion west, right? They're building the railroads. The Transcontinental Railroad is completed and other railroads are beginning. There's lots of factories in the east making lots of product that they want to put on those railroads and ship to the west. Railroads are absolutely central, not only the big scheme of things, but even just to move people around the new urban areas. Um, this is one of the things that happens with high-rises, right? 
because of the technological development of steel framed buildings, a city has a finite amount of space. It grows this way and it kind of usually has to stop, especially in the Northeast where these mill towns are because they're based around rivers. And so they have to stop at the river. Where else can they go? They can go up. With those steel framed buildings, they can go up and up and up and up and up. And you can pack a lot more workers in those tenement buildings. You can have 25, 30 families living in a building that has the same footprint of a building that used to house two or three families. So you, so you can put a lot more people in there. Uh, to move them around town, you have to have like trolley systems, maybe a, a, a first horse drawn, but then eventually electric. So there's lots of advantages that come with living in the city in this time period, but there are also a lot of dangers, right? There's political bosses, uh, there's the issues of, of uh, cultural immigrate, you know, different immigrants from different places are not too friendly to each other sometimes. We'll get into that in a second. But during the Gilded Age, labor really begins to form. And in a lot of major cities, unions are formed not only based on profession, uh, you know, whether it's plumbers or textile mill workers or railroad workers, but sometimes they just have generic New York labor union where everyone who is a worker could pay dues and join this union, and then that kind of gave them negotiating political power that spread across single factories, right? They could all come together and begin to, to push for this. And of course, you know, the, the business owners didn't like this because it was going to cost them more money. It was going to cut into their profit margin. So, you know, if, if, a, if a union gets together and organizes and goes out on strike, and refuses to work, perhaps the company could get them to stop. Uh, the, these, oh, there's so much. But a lot of these begin to result in violent actions. And, and this, is a very, this is a very tricky thing when you begin to look at a lot of these. Um, the, you know, the, the first, one of the first big ones, and, and we'll get in, we'll keep pushing this forward. There's something called the Haymarket Affair, right? The Haymarket Affair happens, a place called Haymarket, and um, in New York. Let me make sure I've got my um, get my right picture here, so I can I can explain to you what's going on. Um, there's a place, and laborers all form in the street, right, to begin arguing and to begin pressing for changes. I want to get to those changes in a sec. Well, no, let me talk about the changes now because they're important, right? So when you're a laborer working in some of these uh, factories and some of these mill towns, the expectation for you to keep your job is that you're working 10, 12 hour days, six days a week, again, with no insurance, with no guarantee that you'll have a job if your hand gets hurt, with no guarantee from your employer, that they'll provide some sort of medical help if you do get hurt. Uh, that if your kids get hurt in the factory, that they're not they're going to be taken care of. Um, and and even you know minimum wage laws, they could the companies could pay what they wanted. And if all the company business owners and this happened, this is very very common. There would be a big meeting of say the textile mill owners, and they would all sit around and agree we shall not pay our workers more than. $5 a week, and that's it. And that way, there was nowhere, if, if someone was opposed to that wage, there was nowhere for the else for them to go to get a better job because everything in town was going to pay no more than $5, um, $5 a month, excuse me, a week. So people begin to agitate for these changes. Those are a lot of the changes they begin to push through. They look for uh, the companies to make them themselves, but then they begin to realize, you know what, there's a lot of us. People can vote, and as we vote, we can also put people in the legislation, excuse me, in the legislature that can pass legislation that will force these companies to recognize some of these changes that need to happen, like a minimum or a, a you know cap a work day, cap the work week, uh, workers' compensation practices, things like that. So they would go on strike, and they would go out into the streets, and they would bump up against the police. Now. These did uh, lead to violence, you know, and there were there are always scuffles and things like this, uh, as as Mr. Adams would call them in reference to the French Revolution. These street actions, these street actions were 
very rarely ever peaceful. They, they very often ended in violence of some sort or the other with the police trying to keep order and, uh, you know, the, the laborers trying to let their voices be heard. And so at the, at the Haymarket uh, affair, um, let's see, is that, yeah, there, okay, I'm sorry, there it is, there's the map. So they form a police line here, and you can, this is, this is a map that was a part of a, uh, the report, and to, to prevent the strikers from, the, the labor folks from going any further, and so of course they're going to bump up there. And the day before, there had been some violence where, um, where the police had had to fire at a couple of the, uh, the laborers when, when things got a little iffy, but, but it hadn't been too bad. Well, here we are this next day, and people are beginning to push the police and push the police more. And then all of a sudden, you see that big black dot in the middle, in the middle up here, and, and you can see ominous words, where the bomb fell. So someone from the labor union side threw a bomb at the police. It landed right there in front of the line while one of the police um, officers was telling the crowd, to, you need to disperse, you need to go away. The bomb goes off. It kills several policemen and wounds others. And of course, well, maybe not of course, but perhaps um, understandably, uh, because you can't change things, the police panic and they begin firing into the crowd, right? They just, they just open up on the crowd because a bomb has just been thrown at them. And so four or five people are killed, uh, four or five laborers are killed, six or seven policemen are killed uh, from the bomb explosion, and many, many more are wounded. We're talking like, I want to say between 40 and 70, depending upon whose count you go by. So this is, this is a significant deal that happens and uh, because of the way this happens, of course, it makes national, inter uh, national and international headlines. And so this, there's a trial that tries to find the bomber. And, you know, they, they go and they find five or six ringleaders of the labor movement who cannot actually be tied to the bomb whatsoever. But the trial goes forward. They're found guilty. Um, I want to say a couple of them are executed. And this becomes sort of a rallying cry for labor. And this happens, I believe, May 4th. This happens on May 4th, and um, I'm sorry, no. Yes, May 4th, that's right, it's May 4th. Because peop workers around the world realize that this is something we need to commemorate, this is a rallying cry, so this is when International Workers' Day, or May Day, is created. So May Day is created to recognize this. But before this, actually, there was a movement in the United States by um, a fellow named McGuire, who had wanted to create a holiday to recognize the work of labor. And they had set that on September 1st, or excuse me, the, the first uh, Monday in September. So America had been celebrating a Labor Day before this, but because of the Haymarket, the international crowd wanted to create May Day as an International Workers' Day. The Americans decided, you know what, there's, there's for a lot of different reasons, we're gonna keep September. Interesting side note, and I hope some of you can take advantage of this fact this weekend. One of the reasons uh, McGuire and the laborers wanted to have this holiday take place early in September is because it was cooler, but the weather was still nice, and it would be seen as a way to celebrate labor. It was a celebratory act, which is perfect weather for picnics and for family outings and things like that. Uh, you know, in a lot of parts of the country, uh, May is still an unsure weather date, and you, you can't celebrate like that. It was, it was not a, originally a very political day. It was a celebratory day, Labor Day, I mean. And that's one of the reasons that, that America continues to celebrate Labor Day the way it does, coming up this Monday, of course, and hasn't really adopted that May 1st International Workers' Day thing for, a, for its ties to communism, for its ties to uh, anarchists and things like that. And it's just, Labor Day is just a much better picnicking time, I suppose. So the Haymarket Affair certainly has a huge impact on labor relations, and, and it's important to, to realize the impact this has on the country, too. So here we have a clash between uh, laborers agitating, protesting for, for change, and the police. And they clash, and lives are lost. And the American people are getting a couple of different versions of the story, but it seems to be what jails is, People wish that there was this much trouble. 
from the police or from the protesters. And a lot of people are very leery of the protesters because of some of their political affiliations and things like that. So there is not a huge amount of support across the country for the labor movement because of things like this. It ends up actually hurting the cause of labor in the United States um, because they see this as, as unrest and violence and, and, and contrary to law and order. And so labor starts to sort of lose ground for a little while. Well, then we get to, I'm skipping ahead a bit, so you're going to have to stick with me because we only have so much time. The Pullman strike, right? We get to the Pullman strike of 18, eight, excuse me, 1894. And this, this is a great example of how things start to change with labor and, and people start to see things a little bit differently. So the Pullman Company is in Chicago and they create rail cars, right? And again, remember how important the railroad is all over the country. It's huge. It is the way everything moves. People, freight, goods, everything moves by the railroad. And the Pullman Company is by far the largest manufacturer of, of freight cars and passenger cars for railroads for all for across the country across the country there are lots of different individual railroads but most of them have bought pullman cars so it's a huge factory and pullman to adjust some, because of the economy the economy starts to go south a little bit and so pullman decides that it's going to have to create a wage cut across the board for all of its workers um but it's a mill town, like I discussed before, where the workers are provided a house. Well, Pullman does not correspondingly lower the rent on the houses that these workers are in. So the workers do not receive any breaks on rent, but they're getting less pay from the same company. To be honest, if you look at it, this is one of those conundrums that it's difficult it's, it's not hard to see both sides of the issue, right? They've, they've, the Pullman company can't go under because their income is suffering, but they can't take another hit, so they're having lower wages. On the other hand, the people who live there are being told by the people who own the house, I'm going to give you less money, but you still have to pay the same amount of rent. That's not fair either. And you can see from this uh, classic Gilded Age cartoon, this is one of those aspects. So there's the worker there. He's being squeezed by the uh, big fat cat owner of the Pullman Company between low wages and high rent. And so finally, uh, the workers at Pullman go on strike. They uh, decide that they are going to stop work on building cars. And again, these cars have to go out on railroads. And Chicago is one of the main rail centers for the ent that entire part of the country. So they go out, they ref not only refuse to, to work anymore, they, uh, they begin to block a lot of the passageways that the rail cars go through. They're blocking, you know, public transportation or at least privately owned transportation that deals with public issues. And they ask for other railroad people across the country to do this with them. And a lot of railroad workers do. So this is the big deal. Remember how important and all-encompassing I said the railroad industry was in the United States. Well, if, uh, if you can imagine, let's say gas companies, let's say, let's say the place where you get your gas, where you put your gas in your car, let's say one-fifth of them shut down uh, and strike and you're not able to get gas for your car. That's going to severely limit a lot of different things and that is going to have a very widespread effect across the entire country. And this also becomes a very big deal. This is, there's a lot of street actions that go on and this immediately garners national press because it's a ripple effect from Chicago that spreads to the entire nation. And again, even though their causes were very legitimate, I think it would be hard for any reasonable person to see how the Pullman employees are not, um, they're being very reasonable. They're, they're being treated very poorly by Pullman. And yet, the effects that their strike have across the country, severe inconvenience of people, uh, Businesses might go, small businesses might go under because they can't move their goods. Someone may not be able to cross the country on a railroad to see a family member, things like this. So it's beginning to affect people personally. And again, that ironically starts to take some sympathy away from the union and from the labor movements. Well, they finally decide 
that perhaps the big federal government should get involved in this one. And, and they do this. They do this because uh, the claim is, and from a legal standpoint, it's kind of legitimate, uh, the railroads move the United States mail. And as uh, the United States mail is a concern of the federal government, the federal government therefore has the power to step in to assure that the mail moves as it should. And that means that they're going to go in and start breaking up the, the Pullman strike. And they, long story short, there are whole books written about this, big thick ones too. Um, they eventually, the Pullman strike has to go under and the federal government comes in and basically uses U.S. troops to force the trains to go, to force the trains to move. Sometimes with the former Pullman employees being taken off the trains and U.S. soldiers and engineers being put on the trains to run them. So the Army and federal bureaucracy or federal bureaucrats are running the trains until it, until it goes down. So, you know, and, I'm, and again, I'm talking about sort of pre-20th century things, but I want you to sort of understand the root of where union labor comes from and how it starts to organize. And even though they have these two things that seem like setbacks, they lose both of these. And, and in some ways, their uh, prestige and the sympathy from the regular United States citizenry is sort of affected. They do finally reach a critical mass, and a lot of these laws do get put in place that I was talking about, like a like a 40-hour work week and an eight-hour work day, workers' compensation becomes a thing, child labor laws go into effect uh, that forbid children from working. Now, there, there are even today some exceptions, um, specifically on farms, right? If, if um, Traditionally, farmers have always depended upon their kids to help with the farm and help with the process. So, so on farms, uh, they can get kids out there, you know, helping them with hay and, and helping in the garden and things like that when they're younger, like 10 or 11 and, and things like that. But that's very much the exception. You won't go into to a textile mill or an auto factory today and see any 10 or 12 year old kids working. At least I hope not. Um, that's the intent. And, and you know, the, as we move forward, there's a lot of uh, things that start to happen with labor. A lot of the benefits that we think of today come about not so much uh, legislatively, but because of labor's power in terms of just what it can produce. For example, uh, many of us today have health care that is tied to the job. It's a benefit from the job. We've sort of come to expect that. That was not always the case. That really came about during World War II, right? During World War II, there was more work to be done than there were workers in the United States, which is why women were pulled in for the first time in gigantic numbers into in industry and production and things like that. And they needed to attract workers because the U.S. government, as, as part of its war effort, had capped how much you could pay someone who worked at a factory. There were, there were wage cap, uh, caps, C-A-P-S. And so you couldn't pay someone more than a certain wage, so it made it hard to get to be competitive. So what companies started doing is offering benefits. For example, a health care plan, or at least doctors and nurses on site to take care of you if you got sick. Child care, right? If there's a lot of women working in the factories, a woman's job before the war primarily had been built around uh, taking care of the kids. Well, if they're asking, if they're being asked to come into the factory, someone needs to help them with their kids, boom, on-site health care for tens and hundreds of thousands of kids so that moms could go into the factory to work. And a lot of these, so a lot of, you see a lot of these benefits come about because people are trying to attract workers rather than the workers having to demand things. And that's, that's an example of, of the power of labor. If, if labor is more valuable than the stuff being produced, then you, you get this balance. Now, there's a couple things I haven't talked about in terms of labor, and then we'll get to some questions and I'll do the best I can to answer those. Um, it's, hard to not talk about the role of labor without talking about immigration, right? Immigration, people coming into the country has always provided a massive amount of work from the very beginning. America began, excuse me, importing labor because there was so much to do and not enough workers to do it. This started off with indentured servants in the colonial era and it eventually, because indentured servants were more complicated, they were more expensive, this is how slavery began 
in the North American continent. Is you were by force bringing someone in to perform labor. Now, most of the, what we're talking about in this concept is agricultural, but it's still the same thing. People have been coming to this country because there is a need for people to do the work, for people to develop the resources, for people to manufacture the things that need to be manufactured or grown uh, out of the ground. So uh, an influx of people coming in has always been of great benefit to achieving the labor. The, uh, the, uh, the Irish especially, for of course, I'm a little bit of Irish myself, uh, start to come in before the Civil War and you know English, Irish, Scottish, and some of those from Western Europe start to come in. And then later on, you get folks coming from Italy and Eastern Europe coming into the United States, especially in that Gilded Age era that I was talking about. And you can see this great picture here of a boat, uh, excuse me, a ship coming into Ellis Island. And it is chock full of immigrants. And the problems that m some people had with immigration in the 1910s and 20s are some of the same problems we have today, right? They're, they're, they're a different nationality. They speak differently. They worship differently. Their food is different. Uh, they're all coming to take our jobs, things like that. That has been a concern of nativists in terms of immigration and labor for some time. As the, uh, as the joke goes, and I share this with my students in class, my people have been having trouble with immigrants ever since we came to this country. Badoom ching. Um, so the immigration and, and its role in labor has always been a huge factor in how labor develops. You get different... Uh, ethnicities and, and social and cultural groups to begin to agitate for, for rights for themselves and then they slowly begin to join together. And, it's, and you can see even today that there is always a need in the United States for uh, low-paying labor, for, for, un, for much unskilled work. And, and you know, today uh, immigration is, is a hot-button topic and I'm not even remotely going to go into that, but it's important to realize I will say this, that it is a trend that has been going on since North America began to be uh, colonized by Europeans through American history, its early American history, up before the Civil War, after the Civil War, the early 20th century, the late 20th century, and even today. You know, there, there are so many immigrant families coming in that are looking for work and that can then become a part of the labor movement. Uh, and this is a great picture, I, you know, I love compare and contrast, but as the Statue of Liberty said, give me your, your tired, your poor, uh, and bring them into the country. That's, that's part of the promise of America, is people being able to come in and they'll take the awful jobs. They'll, they'll do the work because they still see this as a land of opportunity. And if so many people are trying to come into this country from its founding to today, because they think there's opportunity here, I would have to say there's still opportunity here. There, this is still a, a land of promise, as our main exhibit in the gallery states. So there are a lot of things that go into labor, the history of work. I have touched only, I've just barely grazed the surface. And I think it's fair for all of you to know that this is certainly not, I was telling Lib before, not an area of my expertise. Uh, but it is a fascinating topic. We wanted to do this because Labor Day is coming up. So I will do my best to answer any questions you might have, but, but please bear with me and, and be forgiving if I can't quite get your answer. Oh, that's it. Oh, what kind of job do children have in factories? Um, not usually the, the big manly jobs that were sitting in, in front of the machines that the children... This is awful, but this is true. Children are small, right? Children can get into nooks and crannies that grown-ups can't get into. So often if there was a, um, a job that required, you know, being in a small space or could be done easier with small hands, or if the machine broke down and needed some work done to it, rather than having a big burly Irishman try to crawl back there, you could send a kid with a, with a little, you know, box of tools and you could train them to fix it so they, so they could go back into the, to the machine and fix it. Um, so, the, you know, and, and they could do a lot of the monotonous jobs that didn't require a lot of strength. Same thing, you know, for the women, if you're working a textile mill and you need to sit there and there's something like this that needs to happen to make the, the loom work, and then, you know, a, a woman or a kid can do that sort of thing. Um, 
but the kids' work was was dangerous. So the kids' work was dangerous not just because they were young and and not fully physically, emotionally, and intellectually developed, but because a lot of the jobs they gave them just were inherently dangerous. So that's a big reason that child labor laws went into effect. Oh, what were the dangers of working in a factory in the 1800s? Uh, gosh, name it. Probably probably the sort of thing that you would think of. Uh, the most Let's not discount getting sick, right? Because you've got a lot of people sort of crammed into a small space, probably with not very good ventilation. Uh, so disease is going to spread a lot more commonly. They're living in tenements, so people are going to get sick a lot more often. Uh, and their diet and their environment might not be the best. Um, working in a factory, I don't, know, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a factory. I did, I did a little stint for a short time. It is very loud. Uh, there are there are very few factories that operate on the whisper quiet mode. There are big machines in there, and they are just rattling and banging and running. Uh, textile mills. I know we have three or had three textile mills here in Gainesville, with a big you know looms the size of a Volkswagen, and these shuttles would be knocked back and forth me mechanically, only you know super fast. So it's just a and there's a hundred of them on the floor. And they're all going at the same time. So there's noise, there's dust in a textile mill, a lot of the lint. And this was up, uh, there's, I can't remember the name of the disease that's very common from folks who work in a textile mill because, you know, fabric creates a lot of dust. Mesoth mesothelioma, is that it? It is a diastenosis? No, I think, I think it is mesothelioma. Okay. <laughs> look at, look at, see if it's mesoth, M-E-S-O, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's a lot of lint and dust just floating in the air with all these hundreds and thousands of yards of fabric. You're going to breathe that in, and, and you're not... It is mesothelioma? Yeah, it Look is at that. <laughs> my, my wife, the nurse, would be so proud that I remembered a complicated medical term. Also exposure to asbestos. Oh, yes, and, yes, and asbestos. Yeah, asbestos, you know, is, is kind of fireproof, so it seemed like a perfect solution in the early part of the 20th century to just coat everything... And asbestos, because if a fire starts, it will suppress the fire and nothing will burn. Unfortunately, it also gets into your lungs, gives you cancer, and kills you like that. Um, so a lot of these old buildings would still have asbestos in them. Um, but, you know, and, and the physical dangers. Again, this is, this is pre-OSHA days, right? This is, this is big machinery. That, the picture of the kids, you notice there was a pulley with a belt there to run the machine. There was no guard. Make, uh, going around that pulley, there was there was no handrail to keep people from walking into it. It it was right here, and so you know if you're working and your arm goes over there, it's going to jerk your arm up and it's going to pull your arm off. the The physical machinery was built to produce stuff, not to be safe this early on anyway. So just you know the sh the sheer physicality of it. So there's a lot in a factory that could be very dangerous. Um, let's see. Uh, what kind of jobs did medieval people have? Uh, most people, so there's, there's a sort of an old trope, but it's kind of applicable, that there are three types of people in the Middle Ages. Uh, those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. Um, so, you know, the ones who fight are the aristocracy, the knights, the kings, the barons, those who pray, those are members of the church, although they, they do quite a bit of work too, for the record, especially the, the monastical folk. And uh, those who work, by far most, uh, and again, when I say medieval, you have to remember I'm talking about a humongous geographic area spread over about 800 to 1,000 years. So this is going to be a huge generalization, right? Don't kill me, Dr. Green. But th by and large, it was people who worked the earth, right? They tilled in the earth. Um, Usually, uh, under the auspices of a particular nobleman who would work their lands, uh, not always, and especially in Germany, there are some freeholds and things like that, but they're primarily, uh, they're, they're all pre-industrial, except for very few examples of like steel making and things like that. Um, but they're, um, they're agricultural, predominantly, and they're all tied to the land and what they do. Uh, except for those who live in towns and those who learn the trades, right? But, but tradesmen in the Middle Ages are sort of a very small middle class that by the time you get to the 1600s has gotten a lot bigger. 
So again, it depends on what period of the medieval uh, history you're talking about and exactly where at. But, but by and large, there are people who work the land. Uh, they extract wealth in terms of in terms of crops, in terms of uh, food products, uh, livestock, uh, cheeses, uh, lumbering, things like that. And I and I you know I said that that things were were kind of industrial. There are things that happen on a large scale, and they did have water wheels, right? They did have mills to grind flour. They did have hammer mills that could work steel and iron and things like that. And some of these, uh, some of these, I don't want to call them businesses, some of these efforts, let's say, were very, very big, but you can't really call them industrialized. They were more like very large-scale cottage industry is, is the way to put it. But most, your common person, male, female, child in the medieval period is going to be an an agricultural worker. Uh, can I talk about squires and, and was that considered an apprenticeship? Uh, we, I think, could define it as an apprenticeship the way we have the rules. They would never have done that because an apprenticeship is something that poor non-noble people do, right? That's, it's not an apprenticeship, but yes. But yes, a squire is in fact, as we use the term and define it, an apprenticeship. A squire uh, you know, traditional squire, again, we're making a big generalization here, they're going to be a younger uh, son of a nobleman who is in service and is trying to learn what it is to, to be a knight, to be a nobleman, not just how to fight and ride horses and things like that, although that's an important part, but how to behave in society, how to, to write poetry, uh, how to behave in, when you're with uh, lords and ladies and things like that. It's very much a social as well as a military apprenticeship but yeah, you could, we would, like I said, we would call it an apprenticeship. They would not have called it an apprenticeship. Uh, when and why did the nine to five work day begin? Really in, in the period we're talking about, I can't remember exactly when the federal law went into place. I want to say it was the, oh, the first decade of the 1900s. You may have to, to check, check me on that. Um, but you know, the, and when we say nine to five, what we mean is the eight-hour workday. Like I said, you know, sometimes, sometimes the workdays uh, last longer and, and shorter for us. Uh, sometimes that eight hours can shift around to those three shift periods. But, but by and large, that's why we have. Um, oh, I'm so, oh, was it 1938? Wow, that's. See, I was. I told you this is not my area of expertise. So, 1938. Eight-hour work day, 40-hour work week, right? Because people began to realize that you couldn't take advantage of someone for their entire life. They had to have, you've got to have downtime. You've got to have downtime to take care of your family, take care of your personal needs, uh, take care of a lot of different things. And so this is, that's one of the things that we all, I think, take for granted nowadays is that 40-hour work week uh, and that eight-hour work day. And by far, you know, by and large, that's how most people today still work. Although there, you know, there are certain aspects of, of being salaried versus being hourly and things like that that can change that. Um, but yeah, that's the eight hour work day, the 40 hour work week, we owe 100% to the efforts of unions and labor back during the Gilded Age and leading up into that, into that 1920s and 30s period. What kind of jobs would disabled people have before 1900? Um, quite honestly, not very many. Not very many at all. The, um, again, there was no real legislation to uh, support accessibility in public areas at all. Uh, there were no requirements that employers make accommodations for, uh, for disabilities. So they might, depending on depends on what their disability was. You know, if they were able to do any kind of labor, if they were able to sit at a table and, you know, sew or sort things or something like that, they might can get a job. But by and large, uh, those with, with severe disabilities um, were taken care of by their family members. They, they were not really considered part of labor. They really didn't have opportunities at all to, to work. And, and, you know, again, this is a generalization, but, but by and large, there were, there were no accommodations um, economically, politically, socially, or culturally for those, for those folks. 
Uh, and my last question, what are examples of jobs that no longer exist today that we might not be aware of? Oh, those are some, let's see, let me think. Uh, how about elevator operators, right? Uh, most of us today, when we get in an elevator, reach over and what floor? Bing, and we push the button. Back in the early days of elevators in the 1870s and 80s to get, you know, to, to get up and down floors, they were mechanical things and it wasn't as simple as pushing a button. You had to like set the gears and everything to go up or down or how fast. And there had to be someone there who knew how to do it or everyone was going to die or at least have a grand adventure. So you wanted some professional in the elevator who could operate it. Elevator operator. Um, if any of you have gone bowling, right? We take and we bowl and the, we throw the ball down there and then this big machine comes and goes like and puts the, puts the pins back. Well, those, those folks, uh, that, that machine didn't exist back in the day, so people had to be down there and reset the pins whenever, whenever anything happened. So that's a, that's a great idea uh, of, of things that didn't have to do. There's another one. Um, it is not common today for horse-drawn transportation to be present in cities and towns. But before the internal combustion engine, as you can imagine, everything that moved in a city was pulled by a person or a critter. Uh, persons usually have the common sense to go to a restroom, but critters go where they go. And the larger the urban area, the more traffic you're going to have of wagons being pulled, and that means the more waste you're going to have from horses and mules. And, and we're talking literally, like in New York City, tons of waste per day, per day. And so New York, as a public service, had to hire street cleaners and street sweepers to go scoop up the horse poop and take it outside the city where it could be sold to folks who needed it for uh, fertilizer and maybe make some of the money back. Fortunately, we don't have that anymore. Um, and some of our very, very earliest, uh, well, not earliest, um, some people may have a memory of the milkman who would bring milk around to your house. Uh, we didn't go to the grocery store to get it because it came fresh from the cows, right? So there would be a dairy located in a town or just outside of town. They would get up at the, before the crack of dawn, fill those milk bottles, and if you, it was a subscription service, right? So if you had subscribed, the milkman would go around uh, to all on his route and he would drop off certain amounts of milk at each house every day and that's where you would get your, your, um, your fresh milk. Lots of different things like that, but those are just an example of some jobs that are not around anymore. Uh, and I'm sure that in the next few years, uh, as technology develops, we're going to see more and more jobs. I'm sure if you talk to someone in 1910 and said, hello, I'm an, uh, a website designer, they would look at you and go, why would you design a website? Don't spiders do that? Doesn't make any sense. So lots of different jobs, lots of different work through history, and lots of advances to our betterment from the um, efforts of labor. And speaking of quitting time on Friday in that 40-hour work week, folks, that is all we have time for today at the Northeast Georgia History Center. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for being a member. We've got so many great things planned. We're glad you're part of this. So we hope you enjoy your three-day weekend. Celebrate Labor on Monday. And until we see you next time, stay safe and take care. Mm -hmm.